So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Once again, I'm very pleased to be here with you today and uh, for, for this session in particular on learning across sectors on prevention approaches. I am pleased to be joined by a wonderful group of presenters, more specifically, Sabine Rak Rakoto Malala from World Health Organization with her colleague Mathilde Baudet, also from the World Health Organization. Jessica Lenz from Interaction together with Neil Dillon with that for, uh, from Data Conscious. We should be joined soon also by Susan Crowley from the Alvar Center on the Developing Child. We hope she's not encountering some sort of like technical difficulties and we are checking on that. So bear with us for that. Um, our wonderful producer for this uh, session, Jessica, is going to be sharing in the chat more information on uh, the background of the panelists, if in case, in case you're interested to learn more about their background, profiles, and um, a little bit of their history in the, um, in the sector or outside of the sector. So, um, again, welcome everyone. Uh, let's uh, make the most of the time we have this with the presenters and we'll start with the short teasers about these initiatives. So the um, first initiative we're going to be hearing about is uh, from Interaction and it's around gender-based violence prevention framework. So I would like to leave the floor now to Jessica Lenz who's gonna talk to us uh, about this wonderful initiative. Jessica, over to you. Great, thanks so much. Um, so as Elena said, my name is Jessica Lenz. I am the Senior Advisor for Protection at Interaction and I've been leading a piece of work over the last couple of years um, on gender-based violence prevention. Um, so I'm just going to give a little teaser about what this is about, um, and then um, during the Q&A and panel, we'll be able to discuss it a lot more. Um, but just in general, um, oh, they're putting the PowerPoint up, great. Um, there's a tendency to shy away from prevention programming um, for GBV in crisis situations, claiming that GBV prevention requires long-term programming, um, or it's the responsibility of other actors, for example, development actors, um, or that it's just simply too difficult, um, given the crisis environment, um, to demonstrate real results for prevention outcomes. Um, but this initiative specifically, which we call the, it, it's an evaluation framework um, for measuring gender-based violence prevention. It's funded by the Swedish government, um, and it was designed through a collaborative and iterative process um, over the last two years with over 15 organizations. Um, and academia, including uh, field level workshops and consultations in six country contexts. Um, the framework is unique. Um, it's a unique contribution to improving the evidence base for gender-based violence prevention in humanitarian crisis. And it has the potential to transform how we think about and program for GBV prevention by placing GBV prevention outcomes at the forefront and center of all of our programming decisions. It introduces new and tailored outcome-oriented methods, many which have been adapted from the development context and designed specifically for gender-based violence in emergencies. Um, and hopefully in, in doing this, we can build the evidence base for GBV prevention in humanitarian crisis. So yeah, great. Um, so what is it? Um, the gender-based violence prevention evaluation framework, it's a set of guiding approaches aimed at helping practitioners make better decisions in their analysis, in their program design and measurement such that GBV prevention outcomes can be evaluated. So what is the problem that this framework is trying to address? Primarily it's looking at the issue of evaluability. So the research that we did prior to undertaking this particular piece of work demonstrated that the majority of humanitarian programs aimed at reducing or preventing GBV are not evaluable. So certainly we can evaluate in terms of outputs and we can look at the quality of programs, 
but not in terms of prevention outcomes, whether or not that risk has actually been prevented or reduced. And some of those core evaluability problems that we were able to identify include uh, weak context-specific analysis for GBV risk. So oftentimes what we're seeing is analysis is very generalized um, rather than the nuance of what that risk looks like. Um, there's also very few context-specific theories of change um, that underpin the choices of the activities and the target groups um, that we're working with. There's unclear articulation of the intended outcome. Um, as I said, so a, a huge or significant focus has always been put on outputs. There's often missing baseline data, um, a lack of monitoring plans in order to be able to measure changes in risk patterns. We tend to measure our program or project activities and not actually the changes of risk. Um, and then what we've actually seen in the GBV community specifically, um, we've seen uh, a huge emphasis on risk mitigation um, or safe programming um, and little on prevention. And so the balance isn't quite there yet. Um, so who is it for? This framework was designed specifically for any organization seeking to reduce the risk of GBV occurring in humanitarian settings. It was developed for and by practitioners in country to reduce GBV and is for practitioners from any sector, um, as well as program staff, m &E staff and technical experts. So what does the framework cover? Um, specifically, the GBV PEF um, was designed to help you start from where you're at um, and it covers uh, four specific uh, modules or um, key, key questions, um, specifically looking at GBV risk analysis, project design, measurement, and outcome-oriented evaluation approaches. And this, I think, is the most exciting piece um, because it introduces new methods for evaluating GB, GBV prevention in an outcome-oriented way. Um, there are approximately about 13 different methods that we're introducing. And my colleague, Neil, who's um, with us today, he can elaborate a lot more on that as he helped um, contribute to a lot of this. Um, but we're really excited to introduce this framework. Um, it's available to anyone. Um, it's right now we're in a piloting phase, but it's an open source piloting phase. So anyone who's interested in trying to use these methods um, and try to improve the way that they think about prevention for GBV, um, and measure those outcomes is, is welcome to join us. Uh, we'll be piloting over the next two and a half years. So I'm, I'll, I'll speak a lot more um, in the coming minutes on the panel about more of the specifics, but that's the project that I'm talking about today. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jessica. That was like a nice and um, timely snippet of the amazing work you have been doing. Uh, thank you so much. I will now leave the floor to Mathilde from the World Health Organizations that together with Sabine will talk about an initiative like on ending violence against, against children through uh, the health system and strengthening multi-sectoral approaches. So Mathilde, on to you. The floor is yours. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Pleasure to be with you, with you here today. Um, so Sabine and I are going to introduce you to ways uh, through which WHO tries and prevent violence against children through health programs. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to talk with, about the WHO Global Health for Peace Initiative, which is, um, let's say, a primary form of violence prevention in general in society. And of course, this includes violence against children as well. So maybe just a bit of background on WHO's Global Health for Peace Initiative. It was launched in 2019. And basically what the vision is, is um, for, for the initiative to position the health sector and WHO as contributors to peace through health interventions that one, are conflict sensitive, which means that they're aware of the conflict environments, the conflict dynamics, conflict actors we are working in and with, um, and make sure that our programs, our recruitment processes, our uh, beneficiary targeting is sensitive to those dynamics in order to do no harm. Of course, that's the minimum, 
but also in order to potentially take those into account and maybe contribute to, to social cohesion and, and peace. That's the second aspect of, of this approach. It's not only for our, for our programs to be conflict sensitive, but also where possible, where appropriate to try and deliver peace dividends in conflict affected and fragile settings while contributing to WHO's um, goals, which are spelled out here below that we call the, the triple and billion goals, working towards uh, universal health coverage, um, improved protection from health emergencies and uh, better health and, well, and well-being. So as I said, uh, basically the connection between WHO's uh, Global Health for Peace Initiative and violence prevention or children violence against children in particular is really at primary level. Um, and more specifically, I will show you on the next slide that we also have sometimes interventions that can be targeted at children or at the youth, like we have already done it. So here you can see various possible types of um, peace responsive interventions, at least health interventions. Um, one of them, for example, on the left, mental health and psychosocial support, MHPSS, is something that we've typically done with a focus on the youth that were affected by armed violence in Somalia. Um, we haven't done that with children specifically, at least not to my knowledge. I'm not based in the Somalia office, maybe this has evolved, but initially our main target was the youth. Um, that was either a victim of violence or that would participate to, to the armed conflict and, uh, and commit violence. So the approach here in the sense is to say, okay, the better we sort of um, help uh, the youth recover from, from those uh, psychological injuries, the more we protect them from psychological violence, internal ones, so to speak, but also from committing or being more sensitive to, to violence as victims. Um, so this is an example of very operational way of preventing more violence, violence repetition um, with, uh, with, in this case, uh, young people in Somalia. Um, it could also be achieved uh, at more structural level as I first introduced by preventing violence in a given country or, or to be more humble, at least at the community level through health interventions that um, contribute to community violence reduction or prevention, like, like mentioned here below as well, which could be done also through, for example, community healing, um, through a more integrated and certainly more inclusive and participatory governance of the delivery of, um, of health care at local level, and which in some cases, like we're going to do it in Cameroon, can have also an inter-community dialogue component, which aims at building trust between communities where we notice tensions, and in some cases, violence. Um, so these are examples of uh, how the the Global Health for Peace Initiative can contribute to uh, not just conflict prevention, conflict reduction, but also to violence reduction, violence prevention, including towards children. And I will pass over to my colleague Sabine to now focus on, um, on uh, WHO's work on the prevention of violence against children through health programs more specifically. Thank you, Mathilde, and hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm just gonna take two minutes. Um, first, I just wanna show you two slides that are literally hot off the press because the research just came out last week and it's actually being presented tomorrow, but I was allowed to sneak preview it to you. I think you'll be just as shocked as me to see these numbers that um, a study conducted by CDC, USAID, World Bank, WHO, and it shows that uh, for each uh, COVID death, there's, uh, for every two COVID-19 deaths, there's going to be one child facing orphanhood. So you see the data for 2020, and then you see the huge increase, of course, of COVID-related deaths in 2021, and the number of children that are going to be affected by orphanhood. And so where um, Mathilde was talking a lot about uh, primary prevention, we're looking at secondary prevention on the next slide, um, where there's really three pillars of work that these groups of organization are gonna be working on together in, this, in the framework of COVID. So the first one is, of course, preventing COVID-19 deaths through uh, equitable vaccine access and 
uh, vaccine, you know, addressing vaccine hesitancy. Um, this is very similar to the work that Mathilde was talking about. Then the second pillar of work is about strengthening family-based services, providing parenting tips, supporting family-based care, case management, and so on, the more traditional stuff. And then the third one is strengthening through economic support the families. We know that nowadays people are suffering even more than normal. So if you have to take on uh, a child, an orphan child in your family, of course, they don't just need the parenting or family-based support, but they also need the cash. Um, just to, this is a bit of a parenthesis because these slides, I find them so incredibly strong. Um, and then, of course, the normal work has to continue, like the social service work, for us, um, uh, the, the uh, access to uh, public health services and safety nets. So I just want to move on to the next slide because this is a bit of a COVID parenthesis. And what does WHO do in normal times in addition to the primary prevention that we've just heard about and now this COVID response? So just so in case you didn't know these numbers, we know today that 23% of children in the world suffer from physical abuse, 36% from physical abuse, uh, from emotional abuse, sorry, 16% from uh, neglect, and then sexual abuse, we have 18% of girls and 8% of boys. So huge shocking figures. And of course the impact of that on the next slide um, is not only homicide. Um, if we can just jump through the next two slides actually. Um, so we know people can die and suffer serious injuries, but on the next slide, you'll see that there's also, um, of course, these children that risk becoming perpetrators of violence, depression, obesity, high risk sexual behavior, uh, harmful use of, of, of uh, substance abuse. And I know I'm preaching to the converted here, but just to remind you why WHO is so engaged in this, it's because the consequences are so enormous. And then the last slide shows us, um, in addition, again, to the, the work that Mathilde was talking about around primary prevention and then in the COVID response, this is the more typical work that we do is trying to uh, train primary healthcare workers on these nine components. So how do you recognize children um, that have been abused? How do you do a quick and solid risk assessment? How do you do a medical history and physical uh, examination? You know, has it been burns uh, on the back, on the head, and in the, in the legs? Um, what kind of uh, um, physical examinations do you have to do? And then of course, immediate support for women that have been, uh, and boys, girls and boys, sorry, that have suffered sexual abuse, making sure that, um, uh, the, the pregnancy care um, and uh, uh, HIV AIDS, psychological first aid, and then the ethical principles is so important. We have this assumption that we should all be reporting all cases of child maltreatment, but that's not the case. You can, if you have teachers or community members all reporting child maltreatment, that can in fact put children in a worse situation. So there's a lot of thinking around that, that the health sector is trying to um, assess and, and promote. Then addressing the health, uh, the needs of healthcare providers, and coordination, of course, uh, across all these services. So just back at the WHO in a summary, there's this peace building component, there's this child maltreatment component, and then there's a strong component around family care and family support. Back to you. Over. I think you're on mute, Elena. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Hopefully, yes, wonderful. Um, thank you all for trying to squeeze so much content into such um, a tight time frame. We have limited time available and we're trying to make the most like, of your expertise. I will now leave the floor to Susan Crowley, who made it. Yay. And uh, we will be hearing about the Science by Design project that uh, we have been co working on for the Alliance. Welcome, Susan, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Elena. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Um, apologies for giving anyone a heart attack who thought I wasn't going to show up. I had the time zone wrong. I was very nice and chill and having a cup of tea, and then I realized I was way off. Um, so I am Susan Crowley, and I'm here from the Center on the Developing Child at Harvard, and I um, have a little video clip to show you, but before we show that, I just want to give you a little bit of background around on what the center does. So um, we are, uh, what we do is science translation and then uh, support folks uh, to apply the science. So we don't do any primary research ourselves. We're an intermediary organization uh, based at the university, and we have a staff of about 30 folks. We've been in business for about 15 years now. 
Um, and what we really do is take the science off the shelf and uh, put it into action uh, in, uh, pro for programs, uh, policy, uh, services. Um, and we do that in collaboration with the folks at those locations. Um, and the way we do that is we have three science-informed uh, design principles, and you'll hear about those in the video a little bit. Um, but what these principles, uh, what applying these principles is, it will do is get at that primary prevention that's so important. Um, so we are particularly in the business of changing, um, changing things in early life. So we're focused in on prenatal to age three. Um, and, and the reason for that is because of the amount of brain development that's happening in that, at that time period. Um, and what we try to do with these design principles is create experiences and conditions for young children and their families that support their healthy development in all kinds of settings. Um, so we're, the goal is to prevent uh, exposure to harm, uh, exposure to a lot of stress, what we call toxic stress in, for little children, and also to build their resilience um, in kids and in families to get to better short-term and long-term outcomes. So our approach is not to bring solutions. Uh, we bring a process that uses these design principles. We also draw heavily on other bodies of knowledge and practice. So um, the lean startup approach we use pretty heavily and uh, also uh, human-centered design or design thinking. Um, and we use we start with the lens of the science, so it's a it's a little bit of a mashup of all those different ways of thinking, um, but draw heavily on the expertise of local act actors, so staff who are working with kids and families or the families themselves. Uh, and as Elena mentioned, we're currently working with a subgroup of actors in the humanitarian setting, and so we're very excited about that. We're going to be walking through the process, the design process, with uh, two teams. Um, and, and hopefully do some design and iteration on the programming that they offer. Um, so the, the video does dive into the three principles a little bit. So let's have a look and learn about those. Um. the sound I'll try again yes thanks Jessica moving forward as a society depends on children developing to their full potential and the science of early childhood development can help us figure out the best ways to make this happen there's a lot of science to draw from molecular biology neuroscience genomics, and behavioral health. So figuring out how we can actually use all this knowledge can be a big challenge. But out of all of that science, we know that early childhood environments and experiences, even those before birth, shape our learning capacities, behaviors, and physical and mental health across the lifespan. That is huge. Even better, we can identify three key principles that anyone can use to better support developing children and the adults who care for them. And that's where you come in. As a community leader, policymaker, or practitioner, you bring your own knowledge, experience, and expertise to this challenge. And you can use these scientific principles to get better outcomes for the families you care about. Think of the principles as a guiding star. They can help you design better programs, practices, and services, and point you towards what's most important for helping children and families thrive. Principle one, support responsive relationships. Responsive serve and return interaction between adults and young children builds healthy brain architecture. Relationships help adults deal with life's challenges and help children build resilience. In fact, having stable responsive relationships with committed adults is the single most common factor in children who develop the capacity to overcome serious hardship in life. Principle two, Strengthen core life skills. The essential skills we all need to successfully manage life, work, and relationships are learned through coaching and practice, starting in the earliest years and continuing into adulthood. Known as executive function and self-regulation skills, these crucial capabilities support our ability to focus, adapt to change, resist impulsive behaviors, plan ahead, and achieve goals. 
Principle three, reduce sources of stress. Millions of children and families experience severe stress every day caused by things like poverty, community violence, racism, substance abuse, mental illness, and more. Excessive unrelenting stress can be both disruptive and destructive for kids and adults. So doing everything we can about the sources of that stress is key. All of these principles are connected. Responsive relationships are one of the best ways to reduce stress and practice skills in a playful way. When we have less stress, we're better able to focus on people and skill building instead of putting out fires. And core life skills can help us find solutions to challenging situations, giving us the time and energy for relationships. By applying these science by design principles, our policies, programs, and services can create the conditions and experiences that support child development at all levels, for the individual, in the community, and across society. Follow that guiding star, and you'll be on the path to better outcomes for every child and family. Wonderful. Thank you, Susan, and um, thank you for the video. So I would like now to do a little bit of an exercise. Like uh, we have a number of questions that we have thought of that could be really interesting to hear the, the presenters of like this session on working across sector or learning from across sector um, talk about. And we have tried to make a list of those questions. So um, you will be seeing that Jessica will post in the chat a link to uh, an application called Group Mom. And if you click on it, you will be able to access a screen where all of these questions are listed. And um, Jessica, if you can also share the, the, the list of the questions. So these are the questions. Um, the first step is actually to read through them, and then we'll go through a ranking exercise. This doesn't mean that we will not take your questions, like there is still going to be a little bit of time um, to do that, but we thought, you know, there are some themes that we wanted to emerge and that possibly link all of these initiatives together that would be really good to hear about. So get your reading glasses on, like I do, and read through those questions. I'll take them off because they give a reflex on Zoom. They're not the best. And um, start thinking of which question sounds like the most palatable to you. So I will be silent for just like a couple of minutes to allow time for everyone to go through them. So. I can see you. Some of some of you are already liking the questions, um, so I'll give like a few more seconds to allow to read through. And it's also good to um, to like. I will go through a ranking exercise in a minute. And now my clock is gone. I can't see anymore. So it seems like most of you have gone through all of the questions, like or most. So for those of you who have already completed the reading of the question, you can already move on to the ranking exercise. Like to do so, you have to click this um, um, in the top right and sorry, top left and corner. I'm terrible with right and left, unfortunately. Uh, you click the rate button and you will access another screen where you can move um, a dot from zero to 11, where one will be your preferred question and 11 your less prioritized question, which you still would like to hear about, hopefully, but that uh, you'd leave less space to. So one, your highest priority, 11, your um, question, which is your least favorite, so to speak. And then we'll see the results together. 
um, that um, Jessica will show shortly. And what we will do is we'll ask our presenters to take those questions in terms or like individually, depending on the question themselves. It says, um, okay, it shouldn't ask you for a password, Ivanka. So Ivana. It might just be an email address you need to put in. Okay. It shouldn't be a password. It looks like other people have been able to access it. Okay, wonderful. Uh -huh. hmm. I'll tell you what, Ivana, if there is a question that you'd really like to prioritize, like just drop it in the chat, like, or let me know which one it is in the list of that. Um, Jessica should, and we can look it up and have your voting somehow like that. Otherwise, Jessica, when you, ca you can also shout, show the results slide so that we can start taking those questions or move this forward. Okay. Okay, so this is the result screen already, like we just give it like one more second, like to have people vote. Um, It's changing all the time. <laughs> it's going to be difficult to start with one question. Um, so it seems like the first question is for Susan. And given that she's the last presenter, it connects well to her presentation. So I'm going to start with that, like Susan, if you don't mind. So the question will be, what does it mean when we talk about outcomes oriented? Oh, sorry, it has changed. Okay, I'll just give it a minute, then we close the voting, <laughs> just if we can do that, otherwise the questions will change again. Okay. All right, so I'll stick to, we'll stop the voting now and we go with what we have, okay? Okay, dokie. I need to go on my own screen to avoid this. So it appears according to the results I can see on my screen, the question that has got more votes seems to be, or how can we measure results of work seeking to change wider community and social norms when working with short-term projects funding cycle, often seen within humanitarian programming? And this can be asked to all of our presenters, but I maybe we'll go with um, um, Jessica. I'm actually going to turn this over to my colleague, uh, Neil, um, okay. who, who worked sig uh, significantly on the GBVPEF um, and really looked at this particular question with communities and organizations on the ground in some of our six different countries. So I think he's best placed at the moment to talk about this. So go ahead, Neil. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you, Elena. And just to check, I think I was seeing different questions on that list. So we're on the time frame question right now, right? We're on the how do you measure change over such a short time frame? Is that correct? Uh, we all... No, sorry. It's oh. the question around uh, how do you measure community? Sorry, I, I'll reread the question. I apologize for this ECAP. Um, how can we measure results of work seeking to change whether community and social norms when working in short term project funding cycle? So it's the one about the timeframes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. 
So thank you, Elena. And, and like I say, thank you, Jessica. That is an issue that we looked at in great depth when we were developing the GBB PEF. Um, in a sense, um, there were many challenges that we saw in that work. And it, in a way, I think this is kind of the biggest challenge of them all from a methodological point of view, um, purely because you, you, know, you can't buy time. There's nothing you can do about it. If you have a short time frame, a six or, or 12 month uh, project cycle, it's very hard to measure change of the, the types of community-based norms change that we're all talking about. So I think you all know that. Um, it's just to say that there's no kind of quick methodological fix to it. it it's really a core gritty problem we have to try and look at. Um, I would say, first of all, there are some approaches that you can try and take towards it, but we did see some movement on the donor side that there was some sensitivity to that problem. Um, and so the growth of multi-year funding packages and also consortium approaches, consortium approaches to, to monitoring and evaluation that we've seen in other sectors in the humanitarian uh, sphere. It, these are all ways that donors and organizations can work together to try and separate the time frame for the measurement and the evidence base from the short-term project cycle. So if you have a consortia like with the cash coordination group in Lebanon, you can team up and build a, an evidence framework that lasts over several project cycles. Um, if you have multi-year funding programs, of course, that's much, much easier to do. Um, but when those options are not there, I think there's two things that we saw when we were trialing and testing out the ideas in, in the GBVPF. Um, and those ideas came from different organizations working on GBV prevention in different contexts. But essentially, I'd say the first thing is to invest at the country level or area level evidence framework. So what I mean there is having some kind of theory of change that's attached to your work in South Sudan on um, child, child protection, for example, and, and say, what is it you're trying to achieve at a country level over a, a sort of a medium term um, timeline across multiple projects? Many organizations have something like that. And, and when the individual project monitoring systems are tied to that level of analysis, it, and it starts to enable some learning across multiple project portfolios. So that was one thing that we saw in some cases that seemed to work. The other thing would be to identify steps along the path to change. So rather than just saying, I'm looking for um, some evidence about the biggest kind of change you're looking at. So it might be that you're working on, I don't know, say detainment of children um, in the justice system. You might have a global objective that's quite high level about norms change there and the, and the approaches of the government around child rights but you can identify steps along that path towards that change that are still changes in the community they're not outputs they're not things like numbers of trainings that you've done but they're steps along the path to, to that broader change things like public commitments to stopping detainment in that case or formal policies or legal frameworks change behavior of individual policing groups or judiciary groups steps along that path that you can then try to measure on a six to 12 month basis. And you can start to build the evidence for change that is happening and will hopefully continue to happen after that six to 12 month project cycle has closed. Um, so I'd say those are the kind of the approaches that we saw, the nascent approaches that we saw when developing the GBV path that I think could have potential applications in the child protection space as well. Um, so Elena, I hope that's answered the, the question for, for you. Uh, I'll turn it back to you for the next question. Thank you, Neil. That was um, very useful, actually. Sabine, Mathilde, would you um, be interested in coming in here and um, share a bit of your learning, Sabine? Um, I think Neil said it in the beginning. I found actually donors to be so much more intelligent um, often than the programs ourselves. They're actually very interested in funding these prevention programs. They see as well that prevention beats the response. So. Um, I've really had the experience, especially around parenting support and um, what Susan has been talking about. There's a huge investment now in parenting support, change of legislation, norms programs. I mean, those are solid investments in prevention programs um, and school based interventions to protect children. Um, and I see that all as prevention. So I think we're actually really going into the right direction. But maybe Mathilde wants to add something. Thanks, Susan. Sir. Thanks, Mathilde, and thanks, uh, Sabine. Anything from your side, Susan? I think I would just also echo uh, what, what Neil has put out. We rely heavily on theory of change. The only thing that might be a little different is because we're involved in designing with folks, 
um, there, we usually start with a feasibility test. So testing whether the staff can actually pull it off and testing whether the families, whether it provides value to families or not. Um, so that's a very, very early stage, way far, far earlier than actually reaching social change um, or changing norms. Um, but it, it's what we're looking for is just trying to get a toehold on, you know, is this providing value and, and eventually uh, is it making the impact that we expect? And again, a theory of change is just a hugely valuable tool for helping organize your thinking to go down that path. Wonderful, thanks. The next question that was prioritized, um, I will read in a second, just for those that would like to use the chat also to drop their own questions, please do so. I'll try and keep track of those questions. And if we have time, we'll pick like some of those questions as well. Um, as I was saying, the second question is for all presenters, and it's around the fact that, that all of the initiatives that have been presented today, the, the, the Science by Design project, the gender-based um, prevention, gender-based violence prevention framework, as well as as well as the peace building aspects and health system aspects, um, that we have talked with Sabine and Mathilde. Uh, on, uh, rely heavily on the design phase. Um, and we would like to hear more or how on, rely a lot on the design phase actually to improve like prevention outcomes for children. So I would like to hear from the presenters a little bit more on, on this. And I can open the floor for Jessica maybe. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, this came out very strongly in the work that we did, particularly when we undertook the scoping study um, before we actually started to develop the, the GBV path. Um, and it, and it kind of goes back to kind of the core problem that the GBV path is trying to address, and, and that's the issue of evaluability. Um, and so what we found is that many of the programs that organizations are using for GBV prevention, um, and this is related to all all kinds of protection issues as well. So not just GBV, but child protection as well, um, is that the, the design um, of a program is generally not designed in a way that can measure outcomes. Um, and it's oftentimes linked to the analysis phase. So whether or not the, the risk that's being analyzed um, is done in a way that can be nuanced, um, that can then help you develop context specific theories of change that can then help you better design your programs towards outcomes. Um, so we tend to see um, quite a lot of programming design, particularly as you start to think about log frames, for example, um, they are, they're designed in a way um, to measure the, or what we would call the, um, um, the world of the program, as Neil likes to say, versus the world of the community. So how are we actually designing our programs that are, are very much focused on outcomes. Um, and, that, and it takes um, a little bit more thinking in terms of understanding the nuances in those environments, the specific um, risks, what, what is causing that risk, um, and then how do we design our programs more effectively so that we're ultimately looking for changes of risk pattern over time. Um, so I will, maybe I'll add, um, I'll bring in Neil to see if he has anything else to add on to that. No, I think that's exactly it, Jessica. I mean, you, we, we did spend a lot of time thinking about how to build that uh, design stage in the particular case of gender-based violence. But again, I think it does apply to the broader protection community. Part of the reason and part of the benefit of doing that is that a really good contextualized risk analysis uh, is going to lead to quite uh, hopefully clearer outcomes, but it's going to make it much, much easier to measure those outcomes as you go through because you can build so much off it. And, and as Jessica mentioned in the scoping study done before we built the, 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 the framework, what we saw was an absence of contextualization at that design stage that then made it very, very hard to provide evidence about um, uh, change in, in, in the community. Um, so yeah, that's, I think that's why we put so much emphasis on that when we were um, drafting it. Um, back to you, Elena. Thanks, Neil and Jessica. Susan, you, you, you rely a lot on the design phase. So have you got any thoughts? Yeah. Um, I mean, I could go down the rabbit hole of both what Jessica and Neil just <laughs> sure. talked about, but I'll try to I'll try to talk about other things. 
Um, so our, we have a process that we can, we call design, or it's actually um, drawn heavily from um, Lean Startup. So it's design, build, test. So it's, it's this idea that um, you're basically never done. You're, you're always able to improve your outcomes, improve your program. So you go through this cycle uh, all the time. And so in that design phase, what we, um, what we think about a lot, we spend a lot of time uh, problem framing. Uh, there's a quote by Einstein, and I can't remember it exactly um, verbatim, but it's something to the effect of if he had an hour to solve a problem, he would spend 59 minutes um, working on the problem, getting the problem right, and one minute solving it. Um, but it, it just underscores how very important it is to understand the problem <laughs> you're solving. And in, in our work in the complex world of child development, you can zoom out and zoom in, you know, all day long and try to land on uh, what's right. Um, but that, so that's a very important exercise is understanding the problem. And then we go through a, bra a brainstorming session, oftentimes as much as possible, bringing in the family in, in whatever format that is, whether it's interviewing or uh, speaking to uh, persons with lived experience, et cetera, um, to help build those or and brainstorm the solutions. And then we do a stage, what we call prototyping, which is oftentimes um, designing a storyboard that's almost like a, um, a graphic novel of here's, here's what's gonna happen in this idea and sharing that again with families and staff, constantly getting buy-in. <laughs> Um, and eventually it gets to the point where um, the idea is solid enough that it can be tested in the world. And again, we try to build it in a way that's pretty lean so that we can test whether the staff can actually do it and whether the families, uh, whether it works on the family side. Um, so that gives you a little snapshot of what we think about when we're thinking about design. The big key, I think the approaches that we use with what I mentioned before is really heavily involving staff and heavily involving families, making sure those important voices are at the table. Thanks, Suzanne. Uh, Sabine? Yeah, I mean, I can't add to what Jessica and Susan have said because it's all so spot on. I'm just gonna take it a step further even with that. I think WHO, first of all, I think two things. One that we're really looking at is fidelity to the evidence. So you know that a parenting program probably needs these key components for it to work in terms of a decrease of prevalence of violence against children. So we do want to make sure that even if it's a homegrown program by some grandmother in Bangladesh or you know a school teacher in Uganda, that she does take into account, he or she takes into account these key components to stick to the fidelity of where the evidence is. And sometimes, to be very honest, I feel that in the humanitarian space, we don't look enough at the existing evidence. And there's evidence from high income countries and there's middle income countries, low income countries. And we have to bring together that evidence to make sure that we're really implementing the best possible program. So that's the first component, I think, in terms of program design is trying to stick to the fidelity of the evidence. And the second one that we've been working on a lot is um, scale up. Um, and then we speak about vertical scale up and horizontal scale up. So in the very beginning, when you're setting up a program, let's say a school based into a life skills program, you need to think through how can I possibly, or from the get go, scale up um, if this works. So you want to make sure you have the research component in it so to track it is working, and then see if you can um, do horizontal, a vertical scale up, which is get it into ministries of education so that they actually understand it and believe it. And then vertical scale up is increasing the geographic population or the age population of the children um, uh, uh, accessing the, the, the program or the intervention. And, and what I find for me has been an eye opener over the past two years that you really have to think of that scale up process from the very beginning, because otherwise your project, which works really well in one village in South Africa, maybe in the next village, which is 10 kilometers down the street, it's just not going to work. So I think like Susan said, you have to bring all the partners on board from the get go think together, is this the program that we're interested in? Is this the one that we would want to scale up horizontally and vertically throughout the, the community or the country? So I think that's for me is a key component of the design phase. Wonderful, thanks. Um, if Mathilde doesn't have anything to add, I will move on to the next question, but I will allow to, I hope you will allow me to screw the results a little bit because 
And the third question um, that I am going to um, ask, it's better linked to the talk that we just had. So I am uh, overruling your result by one place, but the following question will come right after. Um, so what do you think are the resources needed to actually implement the, the initiatives or the approaches that you have talked about uh, today, so that you have like introduced today? What, what is it that, pra that practitioners on the ground need to do to implement those approaches? And maybe, um, Jessica, do you want to go first? Sure, I can kick us off. Um, this is an area that we've spent a lot of time thinking about because obviously within the GBV path, we're introducing new methods um, for thinking about evaluation, um, particularly trying to achieve outcomes. Um, and, you know, first of all, I think agencies get very scared, um, like, oh no, we don't have the resources, et cetera, to do any of this. Um, but the framework itself was designed in a way to be able to start where you're at. So there are entry points for every organization, no matter what your resources level is or your capacities, et cetera, to be able to figure out where you can actually begin to start to rethink differently about your work. Um, but some kind of concrete kind of key pieces that we think that will help um, strengthen this type of work in general, and I think you've heard it from multiple people today is there is a need for multi-year funding, particularly in humanitarian settings. You see this more obviously in development, um, but I do think that we're seeing more and more donors come forward with those opportunities to encourage more multiple year funding. But even when that funding isn't there, as Neil mentioned before, having multi-year thinking or strategies is also critical um, so that it's not just three months, six months kind of timeframes that you're thinking, but your strategy is looked at over time so that you can start to measure changes um, in multiple projects or through consortium efforts um, or multiple agencies coming together. Um, but, but also I think some of the other kind of critical areas outside of funding specifically, because sometimes we get too caught up in the resource aspect, um, but is, is really an aspect of um, a mind shift and rethinking how do we understand um, how to do this work differently. Um, so being able to be more iterative in your way of working, um, thinking more in terms of learning, um, embracing that learning aspect, moving away from the idea of success and failure, but being okay with the fact that you might have to adapt your program along the way as you start to learn and how things shift and change. Those types of mindsets um, and shifts also make us think differently about the types of staff that we're hiring. So the, the capacity of a, of a staff to be able to think more critically, to be adaptive, to be open to change, um, those are also really key factors that you want to start to think of when you, when you try to implement some of the, this programming. So it is about you know, encouraging new mindsets, certainly the resources that we need from thinking more longer term multi year, et cetera, but, um, but there, there's also um, an effort too, I think, in thinking about um, how we collaborate with others. Um, and I think particularly thinking about um, child protection or gender-based violence, we know that we can't solve these problems by ourselves. Um, so another mind shift here is thinking about how do we engage with other actors, other sectors, other disciplines, um, and how do we bring those together in a collaborative way that can then whether it's in the analysis stage or in the design stage, um, and ultimately in the measurement stage as well, um, to be able to understand um, how each of us are contributing to those outcomes. Um, so that's a, there's a couple of different areas there in terms of thinking about resources more broadly um, and beyond funding. Thanks, Jessica, that's wonderful. Mathilde, do you wanna come in? Yes, sure. Um, I think one of the major gaps at the moment in the area is, uh, is also capacities. So what we, what we think is, uh, is one of the priorities is to really go for more capacity building in um, violence prevention programming in our sector, in, in, the, health, um, in the health sector. And um, through not just um, a, a very operational lens, but also a very systematic approach. Um, 
what I mean is that um, we've talked of the design phase, right? And the importance of the design phase. It is crucial that assessments be conducted through a wide lens, um, whereby we understand the dynamics of violence against children in the broader scheme of things. And very often violence against children will be part of broader patterns of violence in a given society. Uh, and maybe often, some, in some cases, not often, be connected to, to conflict. Um, and typically, um, especially talking of the Health for Peace initiative, what we see is a major hurdle to implementing this approach to programming is um, staff's limited capacities to conduct a relevant peace and conflict analysis. So going beyond just the capacity of uh, of assessing needs, assessing violence prevention, violence dynamics, sorry, um, and, um, and conduct relevant uh, project design. Um, it's also important to understand patterns of violence at society level, how it connects with sociopolitical dynamics more broadly, and to address root factors, triggers um, in a holistic manner. So going back to what Jessica said, um, it does require a holistic approach, an integrated approach, um, ideally from the design phase throughout. And of course, um, this, these capacities probably need to be strengthened. Thank you, Mathilde. Susan, would you like to add to this? Um, yeah, a couple things. First of all, I feel like I just met a whole bunch of new friends. This is so fun to have this conversation. I'm loving it. Um, I'll try to say some things that we've noticed that are important that um, Jessica and Matilda haven't said. Um, so um, you need a team. Uh, and Matilda was talking a little bit about that. You do. You need. Uh, you need a group of people who are who are in it who are willing to do this kind of design and and then testing design and build and test um, you also need a leader you need someone who can authorize the work because once the design is got is done there's nothing more uh, disheartening than than realizing you can't get it off the ground so you need a leader who's who says you can spend your time on this staff and i'll put some money behind it um, and then um, someone to facilitate the design process. Someone has to sort of hold the project, um, gather all the people who are involved, keep it moving along. Um, so those I'm talking a little bit about some of the roles that folks need to play. Um, and then just a little heads up that we, the center is going to uh, build an online toolkit and put it uh, on our website for free so that it can, you know, a team could walk through the process independently. Um, so stay tuned for that. Thanks, Susan. That's wonderful. Actually, um, there was another question which uh, was around evidence, which I think we have talked like a fair amount about. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to prioritize uh, three questions like that you have ranked, obviously, um, as the highest preferences for each one of the initiatives. And then we can maybe take a couple of questions from the chat. So I'm hopeful that timing will allow to do that. So. Actually, the next question is for you, Susan. I'm sorry to keep you on the spotlight. And it's what are the key steps for transferring the latest scientific early childhood development finding into programs? Back over to How you, How much Susan. time do I have? <laughs> it's a, a big problem. Not a lot. <laughs> Uh, this is, so there's multiple steps. So there's what we call um, synthesis of the science, because as you saw in the video, we draw on genomics, we draw on biology, we draw on developmental psychology, like multiple science fields, pull them all together. Um, I saw somebody had a question in the chat about like why these principles, basically they're, they're easy to understand, they're, they're easy to communicate, but more importantly, all the scientists agree on them. Um, so we do that work and then we, we package it up, we do some translation work, and then all of that happens before we even get to applying to the application 
um, phase. So I would say the key steps are synthesis of the science and then translating it, putting into language normal people like me, I'm not a scientist, me, people like me can understand. And then we do the application phase, which is the design, build, and test phase. Um, so that's a really quick um, summary of, of what the process looks like. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Susan. I will now pass this to others, but rather I will go into the next question, which is uh, specifically for uh, the colleagues from the World Health Organizations, and I think Sabine was going to take uh, this one specifically, and it's uh, around um, what is the role of the health sector in preventing violence against children? Thank you, Elena. I think I, You're welcome, I Sabine. It. Sorry, yeah, sorry. I think I presented it very quickly in the trailer, but I would say really it's two pillars of work. I mean, three pillars of work, because of course there's the peace building component that Mathilde has been presenting in which um, we're working at so many levels in terms of creating equitable health care and governance structures to strengthen peace building. That would be the first pillar of work. The second, which is a strong prevention component as well, um, probably secondary prevention at this point is family strengthening. So uh, trying to, through health systems, get tips to parents. Um, in many of your countries, you have um, healthcare workers that accompany uh, mothers during pre-birth and the, the, the months after birth. How can we get those uh, uh, healthcare workers to not only come in and weigh the babies and talk about vaccinations, but also talk about domestic abuse and, you know, how is a mother dealing with the new children in the household, how is the father dealing with it, and so on. So, so the second pillar of work for the health sector is really around strengthening parent support through the health sector. And then the third one is really around the identification and support uh, of child maltreatment. And in many of our countries, unfortunately, even here in Switzerland where I live, I would say the health sector isn't capacitated today and doesn't really know what to do um, in terms of uh, assessing the children and then making sure that the referral system is kind of flawless between the first moment he or she comes to the hospital and then gets the social support, the medical support, the legal support, the psychological support that he or she needs. So I think those three pillars of work around peace building, family support and parenting support through the health system and uh, um, identification and referral of, of cases. Okay, flowing from this question, next one up, I think I would go with Mathilde on how as the W, how, how, sorry, I'm stumbling in my English today, how has WHO engaged in peace building and what has been achieved in terms of prevention outcomes for children? Um, so the WHO has engaged um, on, in the peace building sector first in the 80s, 90s. Um, and since more recently, since 2019. So in the 80s, 90s, uh, there was an initiative that was launched that was called uh, Health as a Bridge for Peace, um, whereby uh, health interventions in conflict affected settings were an opportunity to um, improve access to populations um, which had limited access to, to social services in general, including health services, of course while trying to uh, bring in different parties to a conflict together. So for example, in El Salvador, um, where there was an active conflict at the time, um, the, the, the health, and, uh, health program that WHO was then supporting contributed to um, having, um, I think, three day long uh, sort of ceasefires on the ground in order to facilitate access to certain populations in delivering vaccination. Uh, so that was an agreement that was negotiated between two armed groups, two parties to the conflict, in order to facilitate access to health services while um, bringing those two parties around the same table and collaborate uh, through the entry point of health. Um, that has directly or indirectly actually even contributed to the broader peace process that was taking place at the time between those same parties to the conflict. So this is an example that is a, a typically good illustration of how health interventions can help, can contribute 
um, not only to achieving health outcomes, of course, but also to contributing to, to peace outcomes. This example is at very high level, well, first on the ground, but also at political level. Now, most often, uh, especially in, in, in um, the sort of the, the updated version of the Global Health for Peace Initiative that was launched in 2019, um, we look more at possible impacts at community level. Um, and um, as I mentioned earlier, um, a typically interesting case has been the one uh, in Somalia, but also in Sri Lanka, whereby WHO through mental health and psycho psychosocial support has been supporting communities with a particular focus on young people in healing from armed violence, but also preventing them from conducting more armed violence, from taking place, from take, sorry, from taking part to armed violence um, in the context of a conflict. Um, we're doing, we're implementing other projects at the moment, but it's hard if, you, if the question is about uh, impacts, I would say it's ongoing and um, to, to be true, and to be fair, we're still learning a lot from those projects. It's still very much, uh, I would say, a series of, of uh, piloting projects. Um, the initiative is still quite new. Unfortunately, I don't think we've been able to, to learn enough from what happened in the 80s, 90s. And in the 80s, um, we, we were not using emails even at the time yet. I mean, it was a different way of archiving good stories. Uh, so there's some knowledge that's been lost. And currently, we're really trying to learn more for, from those projects and to see how we can contribute differently. But so far, I would say mental health and psychosocial support to communities, not just to the youth, actually, but communities in general, including communities where children maybe sometimes are being recruited as child soldiers and they want to reintegrate into society, Health programs can help rebuilding trust between those youth or those children um, and their host communities through different interventions whereby they sort of take part to positive community actions, for example, in addition to what we can do with MHPSS interventions. Um, these are examples through which we can contribute to uh, violence reduction, violence prevention, and social cohesion um, at uh, a community level. Wonderful, uh, Mathilde, thank you. The last one of the planned questions, before I give a little bit of space of the question, to the questions in the chat, is for Neil, and it connects a little bit again, like to the points raised by Mathilde around learning, and is on what do we mean when we talk about outcomes, oriented ways of working. So me, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elena. And yes, uh, certainly there's connections there with some of the previous comments from Matilde, but I think also from Susan's work as well. Um, but I mean, when we looked at this in the, in the GBV framework, the evaluation framework, um, essentially what we were talking about was designing the project and the measurement system that, that works alongside it around the intended changes in the community, right? So in terms of reduced risk of gender-based violence in the case that we were looking at for specific groups and individuals in specific contexts. And, and I think the, the main point there comes back to the discussion around design, that we're not talking about designing for outcomes at a kind of generic level, but we're embedding it in a context-specific analysis. Uh, I would really sort of reiterate Matilde's points about the importance of that kind of mind shift I think Jessica mentioned that too, away from just doing needs analysis and thinking sectorally, but actually doing an embedded context specific analysis of what the what the risks are. And um, once that's there, and once that's been built in that sort of context specific and hopefully consultative manner, um, then we can start to talk about designing projects and programs that focus the outcome level um, change. Uh, and once we once we get there, I think there's a range of different tools that we can start to use to monitor that change and then to help feed into program design. Some of the tools that we put in the, in the framework, and there are, like Jessica mentioned, many tools in there, so I won't go through them all, but some of the tools are things that you might be familiar with from other contexts. So things like outcome mapping, where you're designing a project around a context-specific vision 
you're identifying key boundary partners in the community that you're serving. So they're going to be people that you will have direct interaction with, but who also have interactions with the wider population that you might not have direct interactions with. And then building with those boundary partners, building progress markers, ideas, sort of soft indicators of change that you want to see, things that you would really expect to see, like commitments to change amongst community actors or perhaps perpetrators, things that you ex would really like to see, like behavioural changes amongst them, and things that you would love to see, like community-wide social norms change. Um, so we looked at tools like that that could help us plan, design, and then measure change at outcome level, rather than just retreating to measuring sector specific, but also activity specific outputs. Uh, and that's really what we were trying to, to argue against to get beyond. The last tool, if I may throw it in Elena, before we, before we move on to the next question, that I think it's really worth considering is the use of journals to track change. So I mentioned earlier the idea of working with a core group of people who can uh, have direct contact with you, community members. The, in the GDD example, we had uh, projects that were working with sex workers who they might have a, a core embedded relationship with certain uh, people in the sex worker community, in a particular community, um, who could then um, help journal change in that wider community. So they, these are people that you can speak to periodically to tell you about changes in the way that attitudes or practices or legal frameworks or policies or commitments are happening um, so that you can then build an ongoing kind of shifting picture real time of how risk, QBV risk or, or protection risk is evolving in that community. Um, and if, if you have those journals and those journal teams in place, you can map that as you go and start to design and amend, evolve your project objectives as you go and as you learn more about how your project is interacting with the community space and the risk uh, that, that is embedded there. Um, so tools like that, outcome mapping, results journals, we also throw in other tools like most significant change, lots of bits and pieces that can help you unpick that stuff. But the, the point of them is not the methodology as such, but the, the mental shift around thinking about changes in the community, the realm of the community, rather than thinking just about things that I'm doing in my program, outputs, things that I've delivered, numbers of training sessions. Instead, we're looking at sometimes high level changes, sometimes low level changes, but always in the world of the community. And I think that's the core thing that we we're trying to encourage when we were developing that kind of outcome oriented thinking in the, in the GBV framework that we, that we developed. Um, Jessica, have I, have I missed anything that you think is important to add there? No, I think you covered it really well. So, I mean, I mean, linked to all of this, um, as I had mentioned before, it, it, it really is a mind shift um, in terms of how we think about programming. Um, there is a tendency, I think, to think very rigidly about our using our typical log frames. You know, we get these requirements from specific donors, even our own organizations, and, it, and it's shifting that. It's, it's, and it's thinking more iteratively, adapt, you know, be, embrace adaptability. Um, some of these kind of core traits are really valuable in, in being able to measure outcomes. You may stay on both because I think that's a question from um, the chat that links well to this. It might be a tricky one to answer, so bear with me. But um, Ivana Chapkakova uh, says, we know that change happens over time. And I think it has been a big part of this conversation. What is the time frame we should be thinking about in relation to violence prevention programming? I don't know if you have thoughts. I know it's a hot question. <laughs> and Sabine, Susan, or Matilde, if you have thoughts, please uh, think about it before you're put on the spot. <laughs> Jessica, Neil. Neil, do you want to kick us off? I feel like you were just kind of talking about that a little bit, but I can add on. Yeah. Uh, I think it's too hard. I think my answer to that question is it depends. I mean, it, <laughs> it's going to depend on the particular program and the particular type of. of community and the, and the risk that you're looking at. Um, I'm afraid that's too weak an answer, but I really think it's true because you don't want to be in the mindset of thinking globally, this is the time frame for uh, child protection or for domestic violence prevention. Um, you, you want to be thinking based on a context analysis, not necessarily a needs analysis, but context analysis of the risks that are in place in the community you're working with. What are the biggest level changes, the kind of the real love to see the community-wide norms change that you want to see. 
that change might be something like a several year, maybe five year change that you need to think about long term. But there's going to be other changes that will get you there. And those things are hopefully things you can break down into smaller chunks and start mapping uh, using something like a general approach to try and uh, see how you get there. So I don't think I have a proper answer to that, but I think the answer, it depends, is actually quite informative in terms of how we frame this, this question. Um, over to you, Jess. Yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of the approach I would take too. I think not to get stuck in the mindset of that prevention is always about long term. Um, and I think that's that's what we've seen consistently across the humanitarian community. And that's why oftentimes prevention work is given to other actors like development actors and not embraced by the humanitarian community. So thinking about prevention in the short term, the medium term and the long term. Um, and I think if you're um, doing that contextualized analysis and creating that contextualized theory of change, you're going to see multiple pathways as well as multiple actors who need to come contribute at different points of time in order to create that change and that rippling effect. Um, and so it's it's not just a simple, um, you know, six years out, or et cetera. You're going to see change. I mean, you could have an actor who's, you could have a community leader who's negotiating with an armed group um, to stop uh, recruitment of children in that community. Boom, that happens within one week, for example. That may not completely change the entire army or that, that military group in terms of their behavior, particularly across other parts of the, the, the conflict, but maybe in that community, it's stopped. Um, and so I think you have, to, you have to be creative and you have to think um, about what's going on in that particular community and where your entry points are to be able to prevent or stop certain types of violence from occurring. I don't know if others have anything. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, go ahead, Sabine, please come in. Yeah, I just, um, I find it interesting because I don't know if you've ever been to a psychologist or if you've ever brought your kids to a psychologist but or to anyone else, but it's just so annoying when they just say, well, we'll see, you know, we can go on for months. And um, and that's just the most annoying answer because you just want like, is it gonna be eight sessions or is it gonna be three months? And, um, and I feel a little bit that at least with the violence prevention programming, we are coming to a stage with some types of programs where you can say actually in 12 sessions, we can see a decrease in violence in the school, or we, with, you know, 25 sessions, we can see a decrease of violence in the community. And whereas I completely agree with what Niels and Jessica are saying, that you have to understand the, the context, you also have to see what are those elements that you can measure. Um, because of course, we want to make it as short as possible. You want your intervention to be short and impactful. Um, so I, I feel that we should actually put more effort into measuring the minimum time that's needed to achieve the outcome that you want. Um, that you want to achieve. And, and I do feel, of course, things like changing social norms, I mean, that's so much out of your control, so you do what you can. But the other programs that are much more self-contained, like school-based programs or parenting programs, can actually be relatively uh, time, time limited and time bound. Sabine, maybe you want to stay on because you talked a little bit about scaling up, like earlier, if I'm correct, and I've not mixed presented up because there is another question in the struggle to trying to get answers to everyone uh, from Maria Elena Latini from AFSI who's asking how can we solve the dichotomy between community-based and in a sense unique interventions for a specific community and the need to scale up again hot question so sorry to put you on the spotlight but our audience is keen Thank you. Um, I think it's one that we all struggle with. And I think we tend to think we have to listen to the homegrown programs because they're homegrown, so they know best what's needed. And I think we, we need to sometimes step away from that. I think we can also think, wait a minute, some of these programs are actually very functional and they have strong, and sorry, I keep on using the word evidence, but um, it does work. If, if you know that a program works, then try to take those key components and import them. And so, of course, then you have to reassess whether it's working in that community uh, so I wouldn't call it a dichotomy. I think take what there is in terms of the evidence, present it to the community. Likely the community is in fact impressed because they, or they, they, they want it because they know what they, um, whether it will work or not, and they're very direct. Um, and then reevaluate to see whether it works in that community or not. So I wouldn't put it as a dichotomy in terms of like one is coming, you know, from up and the other one's coming from down. It could be that the one, coming from up is actually exactly what the one coming from down needed. Um, 
So I, I yeah, I think it's a, it's a it's a good moment to bring them together. But maybe Mathilde has some thoughts on this as well in terms of the peace building component. Uh, <laughs> the hot potato <laughs> is with you now, Mathilde. <laughs> I'm not sure I've got a very different answer. Um, yeah, but I, I, I fully agree with what you've just said, Sabine. I think it's, it's actually, it's just a, a matter of timing and it, it's, uh, it's complementary. Uh, as long as you draw lessons from uh, a, given, a given project that's been running in a specific community, you identify good practices. When you try and scale it up, it's not because you're scaling up that you don't give room to context specificity and adaptation. Um, so you come in with your, your, your ideas clear about good practices, what did not work, what are the lessons learned, at least from another experience. And then you try and assess whether the same uh, bad and good practices will also apply in another um, in, in several other communities. So I would say scale up is just not in opposition with context specificity um, with every team that's in charge of different communities. Of course, you will design a, a scaled up version of a, of a given project, uh, maybe at national level or inter-regional level. Uh, but then every team that's in charge of a specific career will still have to adapt a given approach that's worked somewhere else based on past um, lessons learned and good practices. Thanks a lot, Martin, Sabine, and, and everyone. There is one last question that I am going to try and address in these last four minutes we have like on this session, and it's a um, question from Juan. Um, on the science by design project. So this is for Susan more specifically. And it says, the science by design principle sounds good, but where do they come from? Why those three and not others or, does, or those plus others? Like, question for you. Great question, Juan. People are always asking, where did these principles come from? Um, so they come, I mentioned a minute ago that, that we draw from multiple different fields of study. So neurobiology, um, developmental psychology, genome, genetics. Um, so we're, we're, we, we, our job is to take all of these different bits and kind of weave it together. Um, and then these three principles were sort of what came out of that weaving. And again, they were principles, they are principles that all different sciences can get on board with. Um, everyone is in agreement that yes, these three principles are key for um, promoting healthy development of young children. Um, we are in the process of what we're calling science 2.0. So we're in the process of looking at even more current science and figuring out, wait, are there five principles or um, is there a design principle 1B? Um, so we are looking at that right now. And we are particularly looking at our work um, through a race equity lens. Um, for those of you that aren't uh, familiar with um, the history of science in the US anyway, and I'm not an expert by any means, but there's sort of a fraught history of, of how science has been conducted in the past in the US and not every voice was at the table. Um, and, and we've sort of extrapolated findings from one group of folks and applied it to others. And so hasn't been the greatest, uh, it's not the greatest story. So we're trying to, trying to really think through that too. So stay tuned for Science 2.0. Um, I think I think that that oh I know what I wanted to say so what's what's <laughs> interesting to me about these three principles is they're actually not rocket science like right, our grandparents our grandmother probably could have said hey you should have a good relationship with your kid but what's what's different lately is that uh, brain imaging has become very very sophisticated so that we are able to see when a when a parent and a child or an adult and a child interact in this responsive way the baby's brain just lights up and in very specific spaces. And we know those spaces are where executive function or core skills, for example, are built. So we can actually nowadays really, that's the evidence that we have that tells us, okay, these are, these are important things. We need to pay attention to these principles. Um, but like I said, 
stay tuned for the next version. And with that, thank you to Susan, Sabine, Mathilde, Jessica, and Neil for being here today and for giving a tiny bit of their experience to everyone and to the participants for their questions and their engagements throughout. But thank you, everyone, and uh, it was really a pleasure to be here with you all.